The nose gay and her breast reclined. He watched the ideas rising in her mind. Sudden he viewed, in spite of all her art, an earthly lover lurking at her heart. Amazed, confused, he found his power expired, resigned to fate, and with a sigh, retired. In other words, you have this, um, this fairy goddess who's supposed to be taking care of Belinda, and for a split moment looks away. And in the process, of course, Belinda is now going to not lose her virginity, rape of the lock, but rather lose a piece of hair, right? It's all silliness, right? The pier now spreads, I'm at line 147, the pier now spreads the glittering forfex wide scissors. To enclose the lock, now joins it to divide, even then before the fatal engine closed. A wretched sylph too fondly interposed, fate urged the shears and cut the sylph to twain. But airy substance soon unites again, the meeting points the sacred hair to sever from the fair head forever and forever. So and even notice the exclamation point. In other words, it's finally done and the knight has conquest. What is his conquest? He's able to cut off a couple of pieces of hair off Belinda's head. Then flashed line 155, the living lightning from her eyes. She is outraged at this tremendous insult and the loss of her hair. And screams of horror rend the affrighted skies, nor louder shrieks to pitying heaven are cast when husbands or when lap dogs breathe their last, or when rich china vessels fallen from high in glittering dust and painted fragments lie. Let wreaths of triumph, notice the quotation marks, right? Line 161. Let wreaths of triumph, now my temples twain, the victor cried, the glorious prize is mine. So notice now the knight has cut off the hair and and is all excited that he has his treasure. While fish in streams, or birds delight in air, or in a coach, and six the British fair, as long as Antilus shall be read, or the small pillow grace a lady's bed, while visits shall be paid on solemn days, when numerous wax lights in bright, or, 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 in bright order blaze, while nymphs take treats or assignations give, so long my honor, name, and praise shall live. In other words, he makes this statement not unlike Beowulf, after Beowulf has defeated Grendel. That is, I am the greatest of all time, the knight has said. What has he accomplished that's so amazing? He has cut off the hair of a girl at a party. Again, are you ready for this one more time? It's only funny if you know the original. If you don't know the original, then the movie is just silly. Or here, the mock epic is just silly, right? What time would spare from steel receives its date, and monuments like men submit to fate? Steel could the labor of the gods destroy, and strike to dust the imperial towers of Troy. Steel could the works of mortal pride confound, and hew triumphal arches to the ground. He's talking about the scissors now, the steel. What wonder there, fair nymph, what wonder then, fair nymph, thy hair should feel the conquering force of unresisted steel? I'm on page 640. And now, from Canto 5, we're going to skip ahead now to Canto 5. In Canto 5, after Umbriel, a dusky melancholy sprite, empties a bag filled with the force of female lungs, sighs, sobs, and passions in the, wage, in the war of tongues onto Belinda's head, the lady erupts over the loss of her lock of hair. Then she bids her beau, Sir Plume, to demand the precious hairs, but Plume is unable to persuade the Baron to return the hair. In other words, now you have this negotiation. In the Iliad, of course, you have uh, a, a much more serious, at the very end of the Iliad, you have the king of Troy, Priam, asking Achilles for the body of his dead son, Hector. And again, Pope just making total fun of a very serious thing. In the beginning of Canto V, Clarissa, a level-headed nymph, tries to bring an end to the commotion, but rather than being greeted with applause, her speech is followed by a battle cry. By the way, we could point out just very quickly about fashions. Notice your box on page 640, fashions of the time. Pope's focus on Belinda's hair indicates the importance that women's hairstyles played in the upper class obsession with fashion at this time. You have a picture, by the way, below to give you a sense of this. During the 18th century, the world's first fashion magazine was launched by the French, suggesting that nation's leadership in setting styles. Leonard, a uh, hairdresser to the French queen, Marie Antoinette, whose picture appears below, established a fashion in which women's hairdos rose as high as, are you ready for this, four feet. Are you looking at that picture on page 640? They could put hair on top of a woman's head up to four feet, which meant that obviously she had to have servants stand next to her to brace her head because obviously that would be really uncomfortable, right? 
these hair statues were augmented with horsehair pads and decorated with gauze and feathers. English hairdressers quickly took up the challenge, decorating women's heads with horse-drawn carriages, zoos of miniature lions and tigers, and if accounts can be believed, a lit stove complete with pots and pans. Whoa. Here, of course, notice the connect the literature explain how Belinda and other women of her class might reflect their status and their hairstyles, right? In the beginning of Canto V, we've already said now we're going to have this uh, speech and then a battle cry, which again is, you know, they, if you haven't read the Iliad, you can at least appreciate some of those speeches in Beowulf, where, for example, after the after the um, Grindel is killed, Beowulf is going to go off and fight against um, Rothgar. You'll remember Sorrow, not brave one, and all of that. Here we go. To arms, to arms, the fris, the fierce Viergo cries, and swift as lightning to the combat flies, all sides in parties, and begin the attack. Fans clap, silks rustle, and though whale bones and tough rail, whale bones crack, whale bones are what the ladies wear right under their dresses. Heroes and heroines shout, con, shouts confusedly rise, and bass and treble voices strike the skies. No common weapons in their hands are found, like gods they fight, nor dread a mortal wound. So when bold Homer makes the gods engage in heavenly, in heavenly breasts with human passage rage, against Peleus, Mars, Latona, Hermes' arms, and all Olympus rings with loud alarms, Jove's Zeus's thunder roars, heaven trembles all around, blue Neptune storms, the bellowing deeps resound, earth shakes her nodding towers, the ground gives way, and the pale ghosts start. At the flash of day, triumphant Umbriel on a scone's height clapped his glad wings and set to view the fight. Prompt on their bodkin spears, the sprites survey the growing combat or assess the fray. In other words, you've got the fairies kind of watching in the same way that the gods sit on Mount Olympus and watch. While through the press engaged Torelius flies and scatters death around from both their eyes. A bow and whittling perished in the throng. One died in metaphor and one in song. O cruel nymph, a living death I bear, cried dapper wit and sunk beside his chair. A mournful glance, sir flopping upwards cast. Those eyes are made so killing was his last. Thus on meander's flowery, flowery margin lies the expiring swan. And as he sings, he dies. When bold Sir Plume had drawn Calissa down, Chloe stepped in, and killing him with a frown, she smiled to see the doughty hero slain, and at her smile the bow revived again. I'm on page 642. Now Joe suspends his golden scales and air. When you read the Iliad, you get this idea that you've got men fighting in the battle, and then up on Mount Olympus you have the gods and goddesses watching the way, for example, they might on a big screen TV, and then Jove or Zeus gets to decide who's going to win. Again, for your notes at level one, what are we fighting about? We're fighting over cut hair. The silliest imaginable reason to be fighting. Now Jove, top of page 642. Now Jove suspends his golden scales in air weighs the men's wits against the lady's hair. The doubtful beam long nods from side to side. At length, the wits mount up, the hair subside. See, fierce Belinda, on the barren fly. So in other words, now Belinda, who has lost her hair, is going to be really upset, and she's going to run at this baron who's cut off all of his hair, uh, the, these two pieces of hair. With more than usual lightning in her eyes, nor fear the chief the unequaled fi uh, fight to try, who sought no more than on his foe to die. But this bold lord with manly strength endured, she with one finger and a thumb subdued, just where the breath of life his nostrils drew, a charge of snuff the wily virgin threw. The gnomes direct to every atom just, the pungent grains of tentilating dust. She throws some snuff or tobacco at him. Sudden with starting tears each eye o'erflows, and the high dome re-echoes to his nose. Now meet thy fate, incensed Belinda cried, and drew a deadly bodkin from her side. Here a bodkin is just an ornamental pin, right, shaped like a dagger. Boast not my fall, he cried, insulting foe. Thou by some other shalt be laid as low, nor think to die dejects my lofty mind. All that I dread is leaving you behind. Rather than so, uh, let me still survive and burn in Cupid's flames, but burn alive. In other words, he's the lover, and so he speaks back in hyperbolic, exaggerated language. I will die before I give up these two pieces of hair. Totally a joke. Restore the lock. In other words, give me my hair back. 
Restore the lock, she cries, and all around, Restore the lock, the vaulted roofs redound. Nor fierce Othello in so loud a strain Roared for his handkerchief that caused his pain, P uh, Pope referencing Shakespeare's Othello. But see how oft ambitious aims are crossed, And chiefs content till all the prize is lost. The lock, obtained with guilt, and kept with pain in every place is sought, but sought in vain. With such a prize, no mortal must be blessed. So heaven decrees with heaven who can contest. Some thought it mounted to the lunar sphere. Now you're going to have the hair floating up to heaven. Since all things lost on earth are treasured there, there heroes' wits are kept in ponderous vases, and bu in snuff box and tweezer cases there. Broken vows and deathbed alms are found, and lovers' hearts with ends of riven bound. But trust the muse. She saw it upward rise. All of a sudden, the hair starts to rise. Now we've got the supernatural element of the poem, right? Uh, the mock epic. Though marked by none but quick poetic eyes, a sudden star it shot through liquid air and drew behind a radiant trail of hair. Like a comet, in other words. Then cease, bright nymph, to mourn thy ravished hair, which adds new glory to the shining sphere. It becomes like a planet now. Not all the tresses that fair head can boast shall draw such envy as the lock thou lost. For after all, the murderers of your eye, when after a million slain, yourself, yourself shall die. Um, in other words, she's going to kill lots of people because she can give a great look, right, with her eyes. When those fair suns shall set as set they must, and all those tresses shall be laid in dust, this lock the muse shall consecrate to fame, and midst the stars inscribe Belinda's name. In other words, hair ultimately, of course, has to be laid in a coffin and is going to decay, but not this piece of Belinda's hair. It's going to remain a planet in the stars. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, let's go to it now, 2A, really quickly. What are we going to gain from potential messages here? Well, let's just point out, again, what we said before. Pope is making fun of a certain lifestyle culture among the upper class where they have nothing serious in their life, and so they make up drama, drama, drama. When we jump to 3A, you will, of course, immediately recognize we still have these kinds of people in our culture. Many of my seniors have often pointed out, what must it be like to live the life of the Kardashians, who really don't do much of anything other than let a camera capture the kind of silly, silly kind of trivialities of their life. Of course, they're valued into the millions of dollars, and so they don't have to have normal jobs like everybody else. But is their life maybe portrayed as kind of boring and therefore kind of pathetic? Certainly Pope would argue that it is, right? At 2B, let's jot it down. Obviously, the mock epic, we've already mentioned this before. Pope is making fun of a very revered institution, the, the, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, that is to say, the epic poems of antiquity. Okay? So he's using something classical to make fun of something very modern. Let's jump to level three. We've already mentioned a number of titles already. What is for you your favorite movie that makes fun of serious movies? What is your favorite song that makes fun of serious songs? All right. By the way, you can jot this down and take a look again at Shakespeare's Sonnet 130, My Mistress' Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun. It seems as if, maybe in that poem, Shakespeare is kind of making fun of that traditional sonnet that you would write that would kind of make fun or uh, kind of be very serious about a woman's beauty only now. It's kind of making fun in some way of the idea of creating that kind of serious poem. Finally, let's jump to three, uh, be a personal relationship really quickly. What are your thoughts about making fun of stuff that's serious? So, for example, this is the same question we had when we were talking about Chaucer in some ways seeming to make fun of sacred institutions like the church. Do you think it's a good thing to teach people to make fun of institutions that are sacred, to be iconoclastic? And then the second 3B question for you to maybe consider, um, what are your thoughts about m laughing at yourself? Do you think that's a good thing to be able to kind of laugh at yourself and make fun of yourself or to not take yourself so seriously? Is, that's a da is that a dangerous thing in your estimation, to take yourself a little too seriously? So, for example, if uh, an adult in your life starts making fun of you and your friends because of something that you do, 
Do you get really offended by that, or do you kind of laugh along and go, well, yeah, you're right, we're just stupid kids doing stupid stuff? Or do we find ourselves taking ourselves maybe sometimes a little too seriously? Notice in this text, Pope is definitely making fun, and he's definitely suggesting, dude, you guys should not take yourself so seriously. Well, there you go, an, introdu an introduction to Pope's Rape of the Log. Thank you.